We're very pleased to have David Seeley and um, Bill Hamlin as speakers. David R. Seeley is a professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University. He earned his PhD from the University of Michigan in Near Eastern Studies. He has published on various biblical topics, the Temple and the Book of Mormon. He is one of the team of editors of the Dead Sea Scrolls. William J. Hamlin, PhD, University of Michigan, is professor of history at Brigham Young University, specializing in the medieval and ancient Near Eastern. His most recent books are Warfare in the Ancient Near East to 1600 BC, Holy Warriors of the Dawn of History, Rutledge 2005, and with David Seeley, Solomon's Temple Myth and History. He's also published numerous articles on Mormon studies. So with that, I'll turn the time over to Professor Seeley and, and Hamlin. We're really pleased today to talk before Dan Peterson, because we know you won't leave. <laughs> <laughs> but we also know since you won't leave, we're not in a very big hurry, but we are in a big hurry. Solomon's Temple. We just finished a book on this, but we're really not here to talk about the book. We're here to talk about an idea. This book is not the story of a place, but of an idea whose origins lie before the dawn of history and whose culmination extends beyond the apocalyptic twilight of mankind. For nearly half of mankind, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, the site of the temple remains one of the most sacred spots on earth. The influence of the Temple of Solomon on history, culture, religion, ritual, music, mysticism, art, and architecture has been enormous. Primarily, Solomon's temple epitomizes the idea of a golden, ever sought for moment when God dwells among us. This is a topic that has great interest for Latter-day Saints, as I'm sure you know. This is the cover we chose for our book, because of course, Bill Hamblin and David Seeley wanted to write a book called Solomon's Temple in History and Myth. But you'll quickly see that the people that make books said, myth and history is better. So on the front of our book was gonna be an actual picture of a real temple in real time in a real place, 968 BC, Mount Moriah, Jerusalem. These guys actually captured better what we're here to talk about. The temple is an idea. This is a Gothic cathedral. And the people building this cathedral thought in a very real way they were building the temple there. And this picture does capture this idea, the idea that even 2,000 years later, Solomon's temple has a huge interest amongst the three great world religions and in fact is a, is a part of almost all the newscasts every single day uh, in, in world politics. Our book consists of five chapters, but once again, we're not here to talk about the book, we're here to talk about an idea. The idea that we have consists of five parts. The first part is Israelite temples in the ancient Near East. Second is temple traditions in Judaism, the Christian temple, Islam in the temple of Solomon, and finally modern conceptions of Solomon's temple, which includes Latter-day Saints, by the way, and there is a short chapter in our book about Latter-day Saints. It turns out as we started pursuing this idea that no one's ever written a book quite like this before. You know there's quite specialized scholarship in all of these five areas, we never found any word that put these all together, and in particular, the section on Islam, which Professor Hamlin will talk about in just a moment. My job is simply to get you through Israelite temples, temple traditions in Judaism, and the Christian temple. And we need to move quickly here because we have lots and lots of pictures. We discovered something we already knew, actually, from Hugh Nibley, that Solomon's temple is part of a wider ancient Near Eastern temple tradition. And we were trained at BYU under Professor Nibley to always look for the temple everywhere as the centerpiece of all ancient culture. There's five ideas that we want to touch upon really quickly here. Number one, it's the dwelling place on earth of God. Number two, the temple is a gateway to God's dwelling place in the heavenly temple. Number three, Garden of Im Eden imagery is part of this wider ancient Near Eastern temple tradition consisting of trees, living water, and cherubim. Gradated sacred space creates for the worshiper a journey to God. And in terms as Latter-day Saints, this might be the most important thing about temples. They teach us about our journey back to the presence of God. And finally, the journey mediated by priesthood and consists of prayer and sacrifice are the two main things that uh, were, were present in the ancient uh, Near East. First temple in the Bible is actually the Tower of Babel. And this is a very, very interesting story, and it raises a very interesting question that we don't have all the answers for. And that is, what is the meaning of this common temple? Uh, Latter-day Saints are used to calling this the typology. And some of you are aware of John Lundquist's typology that shows the common ground shared by um, most ancient Near Eastern temples. When I was at uh, 
BYU, of course, we were trained by Professor Nibley that whenever we saw a Babylonian temple, we could quickly find the 21 points that make it similar to us from the Salt Lake Temple, and we knew we were proving our religion true. I had the privilege of studying at the University of Michigan. At the University of Michigan, I studied under a man named Professor George Mendenhall, one of the great scholars of the last generation. Professor Mendenhall had the opposite view on this. He said any time you could find comparisons with the Babylonian temple, you were seeing signs of apostasy. And working between Nibley and Mendenhall, we learned many things, many issues that are raised in our books, and they're serious issues. And uh, the issue can be stated quite clearly, I think, is what is the relationship between common cultural influences in a temple and what we know from Revelation. And it's an issue that has, needs lots and lots of work. And probably the truth lies somewhere between uh, the Nibley approach and the Mendenhall approach. Uh, we're gonna speak just a minute, but Margaret Barker has raised sort of a third approach to this, and she has raised the possibility that everything Josiah threw out of the temple was in fact what was the original part of the temple to start with. The Tower of Babel, you know that story. Uh, it's, it's dramatized here by the ziggurat at Ur. The Tower of Babel is actually an anti-temple polemic. It shows us the abuse of men trying to reach heaven uh, on their own without atonement. Patriarchal worship, as you know and are familiar with, can be summarized by the experience of Jacob at Bethel, a place that means the house of God. There he saw this wonderful uh, display of angels going up and down from heaven. And this is the abbey at Bath that shows these angels going up and down the ladder. I primed my children to go see this wonderful piece of sculpture and I taught them the wonderful story in Jacob chapter, or in Genesis where Jacob sees the ladder of God and he says, this is the gate of heaven where angels come up and down between heaven and earth. And I took my, my young uh, children out there and I showed them this and I said, there it is, it's the ladder of heaven. See the angels going up and down? And my six-year-old said, Dad, why don't they just use their wings? <laughs> <laughs> Never really quite survived that one. <laughs> Some of you know that within tradition, the Schoon Stone, the Stone of Destiny in Westminster Abbey, is a stone that is allegedly from a Bethel and provided the place of the coronation of most of the English uh, kings and queens. And this is just sort of a, 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 of a sidelight that shows you the scope of Solomon's temple, how it embraces lots of traditions in our world culture. Within history, and we're gonna do this really, really quickly because I think most of you know this material, the tabernacle was the first actual building. Uh, patriarchs worshiped at shrines that of course moved around the country and commemorated places where God appeared to them, uh, made covenant with them, and they sacrificed to him and made covenants back. The tabernacle is the first official building of this temple. You know that at Mount Sinai, Moses received a revelation of the plan of this temple. Receiving plans of temples by revelation is also a motif known from other ancient Near Eastern temples. Here we have Gudea of Lagash, and on his lap we see the plan of the temple which God revealed to him in the Sumerian temple. So this is something that's familiar to people in the ancient Near East, that uh, plans for temples are given from on high. The temple represents this gradated sacred space and taught the children of Israel the way back to God. Under the law of Moses, of course, only the priests could actually go within that tabernacle or the dwelling place of God. When one starts doing geography with temple and sacred space, one learns something really interesting here. You'll see on the left-hand side, the center of this, if you take this sacred space and divide it into two uh, equilateral, or two, yeah, two squares here, you'll see that on the left-hand side, the center of that square is the altar, uh, or is, is the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, where God manifests himself to man. On the right-hand side, you'll see at the center of that space is the altar where God, or where man brings his offerings to God. And thus we have dramatized in sacred space this wonderful idea of man going into the presence of God and worshiping him and being able to enjoy his presence there. You know the instruments in the tabernacle, the showbread table, uh, the candlestick or the menorah and the incense altar. You know that there's veils here with cherubim that guard these sacred spaces. You know, of course, from the movie about the Ark and the Covenant. <laughs> You'll laugh at this, but you can go into a religion class at BYU today and say, how many have not seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? And about a third of our classes have not seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, but we are saved because they've all seen Prince of Egypt. So they are getting the religious instruction somewhere. <laughs> Looking down from the top, we see the centerpiece of this uh, sacred 
building, and that is the Ark of the Covenant, 